Free throws, rules and restrictions. That's the topic. 10 quick rules scenarios. Let's get started. Greetings and welcome back to the Basketball Rules Expert, the show where we take National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, we lift them off the printed page, breathe life into them, simplify, clarify, amplify so that you can take them with you onto the basketball court where it is most important. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with a betterofficial.com. I've been a high school basketball official here in the San Francisco Bay Area for over a decade, and I consider myself to be very knowledgeable about the rules of high school basketball. This show is all about helping you on a journey to becoming knowledgeable as well. Before we get started with today's show, I have to thank our phenomenal show supporters, without whom this show would not be possible. Shane Jones... David York, Jeff Pappas, Chris Smith, and John Steele. Much appreciated and much love. You want to join the show? You want to support the show? You can always buy us a coffee. There's a link above and in the show notes below. We continue at A Better Official with our week where we focus on free throws, rules, and restrictions. On Monday, we did a master class. There will be a link above if you have not seen that master class where we lay out the issues, rules, and restrictions regarding free throws. We covered the definition of a free throw. We covered the topology of the court. Who goes where? What are the definitions and attributes of specific parts of the court which are affect the res- rules and restrictions? What are those restrictions on people in those various parts of the court? And what are the violations? All covered within the master class. Again, there'll be a link in the show notes below. But one of the other things we talked about in the master class is the fact that free throw scenarios are, uh, are a trap. They are waiting to happen. The game has stopped. Potentially only one player is playing basketball on the first of multiple free throws. The officials have an opportunity to disconnect from the game, which is dangerous. They have an opportunity to get into their own head where they're thinking about what has occurred in the past and are prone to potentially making mistakes. So essential to that proposition is staying connected to the game, recognizing the trap scenario, avoiding it, staying connected to the game, and knowing the rules and restrictions of high school basketball. All right, let's get started and look at our very first play scenario. A1 is at the free throw line for the first of a one and one. While performing her habitual dribbles prior to the release, she accidentally allows the ball to deflect off of her foot into the lane where it rolls into the leg of B3 in a marked lane space. The officials sound a whistle and rule a free throw violation on A1. Play resumes with an alternating possession throw in on the end line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So we've bounced the ball to the throw. All right, we always have to start with, when does our restart begin? One of the three restarts in the game of basketball, the free throw. The others are the throw-in and the jump ball, right? During a restart, there's a special sheet of rules. This set of rules applies only during this restart, right? So we need to know when the restart starts, when the restart ends. Bounce the ball to the thrower, they catch the ball, The ball has become live. The restart has begun. The rules and restrictions of the restart are in effect. Okay? Player dribble, 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 bounces it off their foot. Sounds like something I would do. (laughs) There's a case play. The officials are correct. This is a violation by rule. That player, we could potentially wait the 10 seconds 
but we can't really in this situation. This is a violation by rule. Okay, straightforward, simple, call correct, violation. Now, we're working at another level. We're working with little kids. Maybe we're going to do something different at junior peewee levels of basketball, but in high school basketball, this is a violation by rule. It's really straightforward. It's unfortunate. But that's just the way it is. So the other thing we need to know in this scenario is what happens next. The free throw team has violated. We're going to go to an end line throw in for the opponent of the thrower at the spot nearest where the violation occurred. That would be an end line throw in just outside the lane area. So in this instance, when the officials awarded an alternating possession throw in, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. Let's look at our next play scenario. Prior to A1's two free throws following a technical foul, Team B coach tells their five players to stand directly behind the thrower and behind the three-point line. The official instructs the players to move back to the division line. So a very common misunderstanding, I suppose it came from the ancient, ancient times of basketball rules where players are instructed that they must be, you know, behind the division line or at the division line or what have you during technical foul free throws, flagrant foul free throws, etc. Free throws with no players in marked lane spaces. But all we need to do is understand the rules and restrictions for players who are not the thrower or in a marked lane space. And that only restriction is that they are behind the three-point arc and an imaginary line that extends from the free throw line. They must be behind that arc. That is the rule and restriction. They can stand directly behind the free thrower. They can stand, at, you know, at the, uh, just above the free throw line extended on either side. They are entitled to that. That is, that is the correct way to handle this. So in this instance, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. They were not correct in instruction, instructing the players that they must be elsewhere on the court. Now, this also brings up a situation where our rules mis or our un misunderstanding about the rules and restrictions here could lead to problems. What if the head coach says, you know, and makes this a thing, right? They know their players are allowed. They, they you know, we could potentially get into a situation, right? We have a coach who's potentially... Um, animated or raising their voice, etc. And what do we have? A free throw situation, possible disconcertion. They may take that opportunity to say, you guys are getting the rule wrong. You, they, you have no right to move them back, etc., etc., in an effort to potentially distract the thrower. So we're opening up a can of worms with a misunderstanding of the, of the rules and restrictions on players in that instance. And if you were a smart coach, you may want to add that, like bring those players in proximity. Their proximity and their existence behind the free thrower, they're legal to be there. You could say the free thrower is aware of them. Possibly that affects them, but they are legal. It is not distraction. Obviously, if they were to stand behind, hey, 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 you know, or something like that, right? That's a little bit different but they're allowed to stand at that part of the court. Okay, let's move on to our next play scenario. A1 is shooting the first of a one and one bonus. A4 and A5 are positioned in the first two marked lane spaces near the end line, and B4 and B5 are positioned in the second two marked lane spaces. The incorrect alignment is recognized by the officials just after the successful try goes through the basket. The officials rule a simultaneous violation and disallow the goal. Play resumes with an alternating possession throw in on the end line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no. Okay, great scenario. 
brings uh, all of our skills into play. We've got play, you know, again, it's a trap. It's a trap. Admiral Akbar, it's a trap, right? We have fuzzed out mentally and we've allowed the players to be in the wrong position. Fortunately, the players often are the safeguard. You'll have a one, one, one player to their opponent, hey, that's my spot, right? But sometimes we don't have that safeguard built in. The players align incorrectly. We've got teammates of the thrower in the first marked lane spaces and opponents of the thrower in the second marked lane spaces erroneously. This is a violation on both teams by rule. Great. So simultaneous uh, violation would be the ruling, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. So when was it discovered? Free throw has a start. Free throw has an end. When does the free throw end? Right? We know when it starts, when it's at the disposal of the thrower. When does the free throw end? It's one of four scenarios. It's when the ball contacts the ring, goes through the basket, contacts the floor or another, another player, or the ball becomes dead. Our free throw has passed through the basket. The free throw has ended. Our opportunity to rule a violation has ended as well. That's on us. It is what it is. So since this was the first of a one and one, and we're going to count the goal, the player is entitled to a second free throw. We will correct the players on the mark, in the marked lane spaces and resume with the second bonus free throw by A1. So in this instance, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. Uh, fantastic, let's move on to our next play scenario. A1 is at the free throw line to attempt a final free throw. Just prior to release, the ball slips in A1's hands slightly and they stop their attempt. B3 in a marked lane space steps into the lane. The officials display the signal and rule a delayed violation on B3. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Good scenario, one that we have to go to case play really to get the uh, understanding of it. So a free thrower is not allowed to fake. We've got players in marked lane spaces at the ready you know, the same energy as sprinters at the starting line before a race. They are poised. They are waiting for the release of the throw. They anticipate the release on the throw by the habitual motions of the shooter. So if the shooter, you know, begins their habitual motion to a try for goal and then stops, what happens, right? We get players who are going to react to that and in that anticipation and move into the lane. Okay, so is this on the thrower, right? A judgment has to be applied here. Did the thrower fake or did the thrower, the, did the thrower simply need to restart their motion because of something that happened? In this instance, the ball becomes, you know, moves in their hand or what have you, and they are allowed by rule the freedom to then stop, readjust, and attempt. So it's a super subtle distinction. It seems, you know, usurious uh, on the on B3 who stepped into the lane, um, you know, unfair to them as it were. But it's not a fake by rule, so we would penalize the violation by rule. It's a delayed violation. If the free throw goes in, we could just move on. And if the free throw is missed, a delayed violation and a substitute free throw would be awarded to the thrower. Hey, if you find content like this valuable, now would be a great time to do all the things. Like, subscribe, notify, so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We live stream every Wednesday and every Friday morning and additional videos as well. Thanks for your support. With that, let's move on to the very next play scenario.
A1 has the ball at their disposal for the first of two and is performing their normal pre-shot activity at the free throw line. Just as A1 is about to shoot, opponent B3 gestures and loudly appeals to the official for a timeout. The try is unsuccessful. The officials rule disconcertion on B3 and award a substitute free throw to A1. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So we got a player bouncing the ball, ready to shoot their free throw. B3. Hey, you're up. Time out. Time out. Time out. Right? The, uh, the thrower misses the free throw. Distraction and disconcertion is a judgment call by the officials. It's NFHS says in a situation such as this, we need to strongly consider, consider distraction when a thrower subsequently, after some action by the opponent, let's take that language to another level in a minute, uh, something done by the opponent that causes either a violation or a miss by the thrower. We need to consider distraction. So let's say in the same instance, B3 um, inadvertently puts their foot on the lane line and then the thrower misses. We have a delayed violation by rule, okay, which is all well and good. Did Was distraction a factor by that subtle? Uh, let's say the, the player shoots an air ball, okay? So we have a player puts a foot on the lane line, B3, and the player shoots an air ball. By rule, this would be a simultaneous violation, but we could say, well, wait a minute, what about the violation by B3 was caused the thrower to, to uh, shoot the air ball? They were distracted, were they, right? That activity, even though it's a violation, would not necessarily cause the, th the thrower, have any impact on the thrower. So it's in the official's judgment whether distraction occurred. The timing and the volume and the antics of B3 in this situation mean that distraction, disconcertion has occurred. So there's distraction and disconcertion, both part of rules and casebook plays. So we, if distraction occurs, we're going to award a substitute What does our rules throw? say? Our rules say an opponent of the thrower, right? Now we've defined our opponent of the thrower as being the five players on the court. But if a coach from the sideline, I'd say more than a bench, it could be, you know, uh, it would be the head coach. The coaches say, hey, press on the make, press on the make, just as the shooter is about to release the throw, right? How do we manage that situation? Do we put disconcertion into the game in that instance? Do we have rules support to do so? Do we talk to the coach, etc.? Interesting scenario to address could you know escalate up our ladder subtle warning official warning tactical foul something we, we would also address here so we've got disconcertion on b3 we're going to award a substitute throw free throw coach do you still want the timeout right would be a great management tool here if, if now the ball's dead they could have a timeout if they desired. And we would resume with the substitute free throw. Let's move on to our very next play scenario. After A1 begins the shooting motion on their final free throw, B1 in the first marked lane space extends an arm and displaces A2. The free throw is successful. The officials rule a foul on B1. Since the foul was before the release, they disallow the goal and award A, substitute free throw with the lane cleared. Play resumes with an end line throw in for team B. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, so let's set the scene. It's the final free throw by A1. So the second of two, the second of three, the second of a one and one, or they're only one. But we, you know, the ball will be live uh, on, and the result of the free throw will determine what happens next. Players begins their habitual try 
for shooting motion. And B1 extends an arm into the chest of the opponent in the marked lane space next to them and displaces. A foul is ruled. The player then releases the throw and the ball goes in. What happens next? Continuous motion would apply in this situation. When does continuous motion come into effect? When there is a foul by any defensive player during a player's habitual try for goal. So even though the foul occurred during the habitual motion that precedes a release of a try, the player is allowed to continue that motion. And if the goal is scored, the goal is scored. First of all, players are allowed to extend their arms outside their marked lane space, but they are not allowed to create illegal contact. So a player can have their hands in a normal basketball position. They have their arms up, they're extended, legal by rule, no restriction against. They're not in a phone booth. Even though the marked lane space is three foot by three foot, that's the restriction where their feet are required to be and their feet are required to remain until the free throw is released. Their arms are going to be in a natural position. They could be extended towards an opponent, legal. They could be touching an opponent, not illegal. They cannot create illegal contact and that occurs on this play. Same situation, A2 from behind, right? Um, the, the thrower is about to release their throw. A2 from behind would probably put a hand or a forearm on the back of B1. Let's say um, in anticipation of the release, they, sh they push A1 from behind. Then what do we have? Then we have a foul. The ball becomes dead immediately because continuous motion does not apply. So the free throw has not been attempted. It's not a violation by rule. A1 will be allowed their free throw attempt. A2 from behind, the foul is ruled on them. If we're if B is in the bonus, oh, we are we are now we're talking. Now we're talking. <laughs> what happens next? We have to do things in the order of occurrence. So in that instance, we would clear the lane. A1 would shoot their merited free throw, and then we would penalize the foul for A2's displacement, either an end line throw in or bonus free throws. Great scenario. Great scenario. So let's go back to our original scenario. Continuous motion applies. The goal should be counted. One. We're going to assess the penalty for the foul, which would be an end line throw in for the opponent or bonus free throws. Great layered scenario. But in this instance, were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. Hey, let's move on to our next play scenario. While A1 is attempting a final free throw, B1, in a marked lane space, enters the lane too soon, followed by A2, also in a marked lane space, and the try is successful. The officials rule a simultaneous violation. The goal is canceled. Play is resumed with an end line throw in using the alternating possession method. Let me reread that. The officials rule a simultaneous violation. The goal is canceled. Play is resumed with an end line throw in using the alternating possession method. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Okay. Marked lane space, opponent of the thrower, enters early, teammate of the thrower, follows closely behind. Both players have entered the lane early before the release. The officials rule a double violation, a simultaneous violation, cancel the free throw, and go to a possession arrow throw-in on the end line for the resulting throw-in. Were the officials correct, yes or no? Logically, this seems to be correct, but there is a rules restriction that says, hey, if that first, if the opponent of the thrower, uh, player goes first, opponent of the thrower goes first, followed by a teammate of the thrower, 
would disregard the action of the teammate of the thrower who followed them in. We have a situation, again, we have starters at the starter line, energy. Everybody's ready, 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 right? They're poised, they're waiting for the release of the throw to enter. Just like a fake by an opponent, early entry by an opponent induces the teammate of the thrower to enter. And in that instance where one goes first, we disregard the action of the second. So by rule, this would be a delayed lane violation only on A2, or only on the opponent of the thrower. Right. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so I've got B1 in the marked lane space. So only the violation by B1 would be penalized in this instance. A delayed lane violation. Jesus Christ, did the ball go in? <laughs> the try is successful. Oh, merciful heavens. Oh, these plays run together. Mm, 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 mm. So, a delayed level of violation would be the ruling. The goal should be scored. It is a violation on Team B only. The goal should be scored. If the officials were erroneous and said wipe, again, we enter a correctable error scenario where a goal was erroneously canceled and we have an opportunity to fix within the correctable error time frame. Wow. So, I think this really emphasizes the fact that not only do we have our trap scenario, thank you, Admiral Akbar. not only do we have our trap scenario, we can have very complicated situations that occur by rule. So we are extra vulnerable if we are not engaged, sharp, and aware of the rules and restrictions. Let's look at our very next play scenario. While A1 is attempting a final free throw, B1 in a marked lane space enters the lane too soon, then shooter A1 shoots an air ball. The officials rule a simultaneous violation and an end line throwing using the AP method of resuming play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So we have an opponent of the thrower violates, followed by the thrower violating. Textbook, simultaneous or double violation by rule. Easy peasy. Go to an AP throw in on the end line to resume play. Perfect. But we have to understand that NFHS says, okay, did the violation by the opponent affect the thrower, right? If it did, we need to consider disconcertion, distraction, and if we determine that, we make that judgment, then award a replacement free throw. So we had a situation, we had a uh, a, a video of a player in a marked lane space, opponent of the thrower. She's anticipating. She's ready to go. She realizes, uh-oh, I'm off balance. And she starts windmilling her hands, right, in an effort to regain her balance <laughs> and crashes into the lane. All the players in the lane immediately crack up. The thrower cracks up right? Obviously, the violation, even though it would be a delayed violation, would impact the thrower, right? So we have to make that judgment. Is distraction here? We have to consider it. The move, let's say the, the entry was subtle, not a factor, or the entry was significant, right? Like they jumped into the middle of the lane, you know, waving their arms or something like this, then distraction would be the ruling. So in this instance, given the information that we have, 
without distraction, were the officials correct on this play? Yes. Yes, they were. It would be a simultaneous violation by rule. We'd go to the end line for an alternating possession throw-in as a result. All right, let's look at our very next play scenario. Before the ball is released on a free throw attempt by A1, B1 in a marked lane space extends their arm over the area between the lane spaces and contacts A2 in the second lane space. The try is unsuccessful. The officials rule a delayed violation on B1 and award a substitute free throw. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So, opponent of the thrower A1 is in a marked lane space. Prior to the release of the throw, they extend an arm into the, and contact the opponent who's in the marked lane space next to them. The officials rule a violation on the play. Were the officials correct? Again, our three foot by three foot marked lane space refers to the area where the feet must be within until the free throw is released. There are not restrictions on hand movements by, uh, by players in marked lane spaces other than illegal contact is not allowed. So a hot stove touch on an opponent that you are about to engage in rebounding action, uh, you know, boxing them out, that hot stove touch is not illegal. It is not a violation. If they extend and displace, then we have something different. If they grab them by the wrist, we have something different. But the touch is not illegal by rule. It is not a free throw violation either by rule. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. Let's move on to our next play scenario. A1 is attempting a free throw. B4, in a marked lane space nearest the thrower, waves their hands in the direction of A1. The trail official gives the delayed violation signal. A1's free throw fails to hit the ring. The officials rule disconcertion and award a substitute free throw to A1. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Right? Thrower's ready to go. Te opponent of the thrower, you know, in an obvious effort to distract, the player shoots an air ball, which would be a violation. We'd consider whether a double simultaneous violation had occurred. But in this instance, you know, hard not to imagine that the action by the opponent did not affect the thrower. So this is not a subtle step onto the line scenario. This is an obvious, and also the intent was obvious um, as well. Now our judgment has to be whether the uh, action by the opponent affected the thrower, but we're gonna we're gonna certainly um, recognize the intent and and factor that into our uh, ruling on this play. So in this instance, were the officials correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, they were. And with that, let's move on to our very next play scenario. Prior to the official bouncing the ball to A1 for a free throw, there are no Team A players in any of the marked lane spaces. B4 moves from the lane space closest to the thrower to the middle lane space, which is normally occupied by a teammate of the thrower. The officials instruct B4 that they are not allowed in that space and must move back to their previous space. Were the officials correct? Yes or no, right? So opponents of the thrower, let's say there's four opponents of the thrower are in marked lane spaces, but no teammates of the thrower. Opponent of the thrower moves from the third marked lane space to the second marked lane space and the official says, you're not allowed to do that. You have to move back. Now, why would a player do this when there's four, mark, four play opponents in Mark Lane spaces? There's no real motivation. But is that movement legal by rule? Are the players only allowed to be in the spaces that are reserved for them? 
Let's discuss that briefly. The only two marked lane spaces that must be occupied are the first two marked lane spaces, which must be occupied by opponents of the thrower. By rule, we have to have two players in those spaces. The others, the next two marked lane spaces, are reserved for the teammates of the thrower, and the third marked lane spaces are reserved for the opponents of the thrower. None of those spaces are required to be filled, but at the same time, there's no restriction that we cannot move. So, if we had a situation where, and the other restrictions are six players maximum, filling marked lane spaces, four players maximum, opponents of the thrower, two players maximum, teammates of the thrower. So in this instance, were the officials correct? No, they were not. That player would be allowed to move between those spaces. Now, this, is this rule different at other levels? Yes. Yes, it is. So NCAA women's players are not allowed to make that movement. So anytime, there's another thing we need to recognize is anytime we are working at, with an official who works at other levels. We're doing a high school game. I know my partner, uh, one partner does NCAA men, one partner does NCAA women. Maybe I'm the guy who has to stand up for high school rules tonight, okay? I need to recognize that if we get into any sort of funky situation, they may be inclined to go with their rule set that they may be more familiar with, right? Now, this is obviously not a big deal, this scenario here, but we have to be helpful as a partner on a game where we have officials who may become confused between rule sets. So just be aware that this restriction does exist in other rule sets. Danny says, incorrect, they are allowed to occupy that space if unoccupied, yes. So again, we're talking about the four players in Mark Lane spaces, one can move. A fifth player cannot say, well, if they're not going to fill that spot, I'll join and we'll have five players in Mark Lane spaces. That restriction exists by rule. If uh, a defensive player didn't fill a spot, a teammate of the thrower, a third teammate of the thrower cannot join those restrictions still apply. But that subtle distinction that players are allowed to move to an unoccupied marked lane space as long as they stay within the numbers restrictions does apply. Easy play. Easy peasy. Let's move on to our very next play scenario. Just after the release of A1's free throw attempt, First, B5, and then A5 both run from behind the three-point arc toward the basket in an effort to get the rebound. The try is unsuccessful. The officials rule a delayed violation on B5 only, ignoring A5, since B5 went first. The officials award a substitute free throw. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So, free throw attempt by A1 from behind the three-point arc, where they are properly positioned, A5 and B5. B5, in an effort to, you know, crash, be a party crasher and grab the rebound, goes early, followed by teammate of the thrower, A5, who says, oh, no, you don't right? And they vi both violate. The officials, erroneously remembering that, hey, players in marked lane spaces, one goes first, the second one we ignore, erroneously applies that to the situation and says, well, since one went first and then the other, right? But that doesn't apply. It only applies to players in marked lane spaces, right? Again, reinforcing that we need an understanding of the rules and restrictions and understanding of the topography of the court. There are rules and restrictions on players in marked lane spaces that are different from rules and restrictions for players beyond the arc. So in this instance, the correct ruling would be simultaneous violation. Simultaneous violation, the free throw is canceled and we would resume the game 
from that point. Officials erroneously discount the violation by the a teammate of the thrower, and they reward a replacement free throw. Obviously, this, op this is an unmerited free throw and would open up the opportunity for a correctable error. That was the ruling on the play. If we did it correctly and ruled a simultaneous violation, if this was not, if this was the final free throw for the thrower or the first of a one and one situation for the thrower, we would resume with an alternating possession throw in on the end line. If it was, if there was a, if there were free throws to follow, we would simply have a violation during this free throw and then we would resume with the resulting free throws that the player was entitled to. Right, there we have it. 10 quick questions, free throw scenarios, helping us have a better understanding of the rules and restrictions in National Federation of High School basketball rules. Now would be a great time. Like, subscribe, notify, share the video with other basketball officials who could find value as well. As always, have to thank our fantastic show supporters, Shane Jones, David York, Jeff Pappas, Chris Smith, and John Steele. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to keep me sparkling, you can always buy us a coffee. There will be a link above and in the show notes below. As always, we have additional video content. We have the Masterclass video here. We have the resulting Five Play Friday video here. The complete series on free throws. Have a great one. We'll see you on the next one.